Hello, my name's Geraldine Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. And it's aimed at those with road cars, those developing racing cars, especially amateur racing cars, and those interested in alternative transport. What I want to do in today's video is talk about measuring aerodynamic pressures, something that 99.99% of people have no idea that you can even do, let alone do accurately and do on the road or track. Let's take a look at this idea because it is the single most important approach to improving aerodynamics of your vehicle. So you may not be aware, but aerodynamic pressure varies over the body of the car. It's not the same everywhere. Now, some of that's easy to understand, like in this graphic, hotter colors equals higher pressures. And you can see across the front of the car, this old fashioned bluff fronted car, it had lots of high pressures there. But colder colors equal lower pressure. And that's not as intuitive. See how the airflow wrapping around the leading edge of the hood or bonnet is a low pressure, as it is across the top of the windscreen on the A-pillars, but also as it is across the whole of the roof. And these are pressures that are lower than atmospheric. Okay, so those low pressures are trying to lift the car up in this particular example. Now, the pressures vary all over the car, um, under the car as well, down the sides of the car as well. And since drag and lift or downforce is 99%, 90% caused by pressures, if we can see and measure these pressures, then we can do so much aerodynamic development in terms of lift downforce and in terms of reducing drag. Now, as I said, aerodynamic pressure is responsible for nearly all drag and lift downforce on a car. Usually you would need a wind tunnel to measure these pressures, but we can do it on the road or the track. We can do it on the road or the track quite cheaply as well. No wind tunnel needed, and yet with real world accuracy, accuracy that takes into account turbulence in the airflow, takes into account your airflow, crosswinds in other words, takes into account everything because we're measuring a real car and the real pressures that are acting on it. Here's an example before we get into the technique. This is the centerline uh, pressures measured on a model Tesla uh, 3 uh, by me. You can see at the front of the car where we saw a minute ago there were high pressures. There they are, plus 210, plus meaning above atmospheric. There they are, low pressures, minus 47. Minus meaning below atmospheric as the airflow wraps around the bonnet or hood. And then as I said, across the whole of the roof, low pressures. And in this case, unlike that diagram we saw previously, we can actually measure the pressures underneath the car and show them. Minus 136, minus 72, minus 96. The flat under tray of the Tesla Model 3 causing high speed flow and causing low pressures under the car that are trying to pull it downwards. Pressures on top, trying to pull it up. Pressures underneath, trying to pull it down. Pressures at the front, trying to push on the car and slow its forward movement. And pressures on the back, trying to pull backwards on the car. So you can see that actually showing the pressures acting on the bodywork, the aerodynamic pressures, shows you all of these forces that are actually occurring in the real world. It's incredibly important technique because once we start making modifications to the car, we can see directly what the pressure changes are that result from those modifications. So how do you do it? Well, you need a pressure measuring patch. The one on the left is one that I made just from some aluminium bar and brass tube. The one on the right is a commercially available one. I've also had people write to me who 3D print them. They're just a little flat disc which connects to a tube coming out the side. There's no electronics in them. There's nothing more than that. A little flat disc, the narrower you can get or the thinner you can get that disc, the better. And it connects to a tube coming out the side to which you can connect a sensing hose and that hose runs to a gauge. I like using a magnahelic gauge, the one on the left. Been sold for 50 or 60 years for use in air conditioning, measuring pressure drop through air conditioning systems, measuring pressure drops across filters and so on. They have some significant advantages over the electronic one on the right. Uh, those advantages include self-dampening, uh, so you don't actually get a fluctuating uh, reading as you will often get with the one on the right, and they're much cheaper 
because they've been available so long and because a lot of people have no idea what they are, you can buy them on eBay. I've got a whole collection of them over different ranges, uh, pressure measuring ranges that I've uh, bought over the last decade or 15 years. Now, a magnahelic gauge or the uh, manometer on the right is what's called a differential gauge. Notice how the manometer has got two connections. So we connect one connection to the pressure measuring patch we saw a moment ago, but where does the other connection go? If we leave that connection open to the cabin pressure in the moving car, we are comparing the pressure at the measuring patch to cabin pressure. Is cabin pressure constant? No, it's not. As you go faster, it changes as well. It changes with the airflow coming in through the ventilation system. If it's a vehicle, say a motorsport vehicle with an open window, the, the air is going to be drawn out through that window, which is going to cause a pressure change as well. So it's no good comparing our pressure measuring patch just to uh, the pressure in the cabin. And I didn't say, but the magnahelic gauge, of course, is also a differential gauge. It's got two ports as well. So where do we connect the reference port if we're to accurately be able to measure the difference in pressure between the pressure measuring patch and, say, atmospheric pressure? Let's have a look. What we do is we use a pitot tube. Pitot tubes uh, are usually used for measuring airflow speed. Uh, or aircraft, for example, use pitot tubes. And in fact, this one, which I like using, is a miniature pitot tube sold for use on model aircraft. It's only about that long and it's beautifully made and really quite cheap. Now, we use the static measuring ports on the pitot tube, these little holes that go around the periphery of the pointy bit, and we mount the whole assembly on a pole which has to be uh, 70 or 80 centimetres high, at the front of the car pointing forwards. Now, it has to be on a pole to get it away from the airflow that's being influenced by the vehicle itself, and we use those static measuring ports just to measure atmospheric pressure. If you think about it, you're in a moving car, so how do you actually measure atmospheric pressure if all the airflows are moving? You do it by using the static ports on a pitot tube. Now, everything I have shown you is cheap, cheap as. The most expensive part of that is the magnahelic gauge, 50 or 75 US dollars second hand, incredibly cheap. If you're doing any aerodynamic development, looked after, it'll last for the rest of your life. It's, it's not a gauge that's gonna wear out. And this uh, pitot tube, I haven't looked up the price recently, but about 15, 20 US dollars. Um, the pressure measuring patch, you buy a commercial one or you make your own, obviously the price of that can be near zero as well. So we're not talking about expensive gear, and yet we are talking about its ability to measure uh, pressures very accurately and pressure changes extremely accurately. And that's really what you're after mostly. You wanna make a change to the car and then see what that does to the change in pressures, how it changes pressures. Let's take a look at that. So you can measure the effectiveness of under trays and diffusers. You know, I've lost count of the number of times that people say, well, what's the best angle for a rear diffuser for downforce? And someone else will say 8.9 degrees or just make up some arbitrary number. Who knows? It depends on the vehicle. How long is the diffuser? What is occurring to the diffuser ahead? Uh, you know, how's the floor leading into the diffuser? The diffuser is actually part of a complete aerodynamic system, not just a little tacked on bit at the back. And talking about under car aerodynamics, what about this one, a front under tray? People seldom use them to develop downforce, but they can be extremely effective at developing downforce, far more effective than a splitter, for example. But how do you know? Well, you measure the pressures. So here's a curved under tray. You can't see the curve in this photo, but it's actually a beautiful downwards curve to accelerate the air around it and get low pressure. And I measured the pressure on that under tray at three different locations. At the front, I measured minus 50 pascals at 100 kilometers an hour. I multiply it by the area that was being influenced by that pressure, and I can actually calculate the downforce. The middle, much more effective because it's near that curve, minus 310 pascals. Same sort of area, now 11 kilograms downforce. And remember, we're only talking at 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour. The rear of the under tray, right back here, I was actually quite surprised. I thought it might be doing very little. But no, it was still at minus 200 pascals, minus, less than atmospheric, pulling downwards. Same sort of area, 7.1 kilograms total downforce, the total downwards pull on the bolts holding the under tray in position, 20 kilograms at 100 kilometers an hour. Now, if you double the speed, the force goes up by four. 
So at 200 kilometers an hour, 80 kilograms downforce just from this front under tray. How can I be sure? I measured the pressures. And I could even measure the pressures without the under tray there, just with a little factory front spoiler lip, and see how more effective my under tray was compared with the original configuration of the car, in this case, a little Nissan Note Nismo. Does it make a difference? You bet it does. My biggest quandary was now, how do I get downforce at the back to keep the, the front rear balance the same? And that's a different story. But yes, you can, you can optimize under trays, you can optimize diffusers simply by measuring pressures under the car. An incredible window into what is really happening. No guesswork, no rules of thumb, no copying what other people have done. If you wanted to know the best ride height, for downforce. You simply change the ride height and measure the pressures under the car. It's just astonishing what you can do. Measure the effectiveness of rear spoilers. Another one of my cars, a little Honda Insight, I was trialing rear lip spoilers. Just a little flat panel like that. And here we've got the spoiler height on the bottom axis from zero, no spoiler, up to 50 millimeters, two inches high and we are measuring the pressures that are occurring right in front of that spoiler on the rear hatch. And we want to have the highest possible pressure or the least low, same idea. So we had minus 100 pascals being measured on that hatch with no spoiler at a, ooh, what's that, about 15 or 16 millimeter high spoiler. We were up to uh, about minus 70 and then gradually as we increase the height of the spoiler, we got to very nearly zero pressure, atmospheric pressure, all these are gauge pressures. In other words, we went from creating lots of lift to creating no lift with that 50 millimeter spoiler. And I could have continued extending its height until we got a positive pressure on it. No guesswork. What's the best height for a spoiler? I don't know, I'm just gonna measure it. I'm just gonna go out with some, uh, in this case, a thin plywood and some tape to tape it in position at different heights. I drive down the road, 80, 90, 100 kilometers an hour, all fine. Just make sure you use the same speed for your multiple tests and I can see exactly what it's doing. It, it's just extraordinary what pressure measuring can actually show you. And I'm not even finished yet. If we, I nearly was finished because it's not going to the next slide. Here we are. You can measure heat exchanger airflow. Now, the airflow that occurs through a heat exchanger like a radiator or an intercooler or an oil cooler or a, uh, an electric vehicle, a, a battery cooling radiator and so on, the, the airflow that occurs through those heat exchangers depends on the pressure difference across it. In other words, instead of measuring the pressure on a body panel and comparing it to the pitot tube reference pressure, we simply measure the pressures either side of the heat exchanger. And the bigger the difference in those pressures, the more air we're going to get flowing through the heat exchanger. Great. Now, here's a real world example. Uh, my good friend John Young testing different grill blocks, radiator blocks on his uh, uh, Prius, Toyota Prius and wondering, well, how much difference does that actually make to the pressure differential across the radiator? Now, as you may know, um, cooling airflow is responsible for a lot of drag on a modern car. And so a lot of people, especially in cooler climates, fit grill blocks. But what's that doing to the airflow going through the radiator? John was able to measure it with that block, two blocks, both in the lower part of the grill or one block in the upper. And what he found really surprised him. The, the difference that those grill blocks caused in terms of pressure difference across the radiator was really quite substantial. He was able to optimize which would be the best uh, grill to block if I wanted to reduce drag, but still keep lots of radiator flow or as much as possible anyway. Measure whether your car develops lift or downforce. Now this is just one technique covered in the book for measuring lift or downforce. But we, we looked a minute ago at that Tesla Model 3 and we saw it had lots of low pressures across the roof trying to lift it up. But we also had saw it had low pressures under the car trying to pull it down. This is back to the Honda Insight, heavily modified car aerodynamically. Full length under trays, rear diffuser, a very, very effective under trays on this car, especially when I run it at a low ride height. I've fitted this car with air suspension so I can change ride height just by turning a knob. What we've done here, is we've drawn arrows and the length of the arrow is proportional to the pressure that's occurring at that location. So a longer arrow in this case means lower pressure. And we've uh, drawn the arrow so they're at right angles to the bodywork because that's the, how the pressure force actually acts. So we can see we've got all these lift forces on top. 
We've got a downforce uh, occurring there, plus a bit of drag because the arrow is leaning backwards, and that's caused by the pressure buildup at the base of the windscreen. And then under the car, the very effective front under tray, less effective middle under trays because there's an exhaust there as well, uh, fairly effective rear diffuser, which I've now improved considerably over, over this image. We can say, okay, if we look at the downwards arrows, do they outweigh the upwards arrows? And yes, they do. In this car, they do. This is a car that develops downforce at easily measurable at 100 kilometres an hour, not only by measuring pressures, but I also use suspension deflection sensors to see that the body's being pulled down. But by measuring the pressures, the centre line pressures down the car, top and bottom, you get a very quick feel for whether the car is developing downforce or lift. And if you're not aware, 99.999% of road cars develop lift. And looking at amateur racing cars, I'd suggest the vast majority of those develop lift as well, because people tend to ignore what's happening under the car. And that's really where you should be working if you want to get downforce. But here, you can actually measure it by measuring pressures. And a final one, what if we want to reduce drag? Well, what we do is we want to increase pressure in the base area, the area of the car that's exposed to the wake. If we can increase the pressure there, there'll be less pulling back on the car. Drag will therefore be reduced. And here I'm testing a box cavity, which is one approach to reducing drag, especially on a square back car like this. And there's the pressure measuring patch. I measured it in this case at three locations across the back of the car. I could have measured at six or nine. And I was able to see if this mock-up base cavity was actually increasing base pressure. Measure it, not guesswork. And, and also not having to do thousands of miles of fuel economy, mileage runs, I could measure it in 10 or 15 minutes and see if in fact that was increasing the base pressure over not having a box cavity. No guesswork, just go out and measure it. You know, five or 10 minutes to make these measurements. And as I say, the equipment I showed you earlier will, will literally last you a lifetime if you look after it. It's not like, you know, it's, it's gonna break tomorrow. The book's called Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. There is a whole chapter on pressure measurement and the implication of pressure measurement in terms of developing spoilers, in terms of developing uh, undercar aerodynamics that causes increases in downforce, reductions in lift, in terms of measuring pressures to increase base pressure, in other words, to reduce drag. It's all achievable. It's not terribly hard. It's not terribly difficult. It's not terribly expensive. But I'll be honest with you, talking about expensive, this isn't a cheap book. Uh, it's 500 pages, an inch thick, full color on every page, uh, 170,000 words. They're not gonna add up to cheap production costs, and they're not. But the very first time you go out and measure aerodynamic pressures on your car and actually see what was previously completely invisible, you're just going to be blown away. I was, and I've been using this technique now for well, 15 or 20 years. Uh, really, it's achievable, it's easy, it's not very expensive. And if you are aerodynamically modifying your car, this is a critical technique to employ. Thank you.